ouviremos as palavras do Dr. Arrin Steiner, diretor executivo do Programa das Nações Unidas para o Meio Ambiente, PNUMA. Isabela Teixeira, the Minister of Environment of Brazil, Ambassador Vera Baruim Machado and Ambassador Luiz Alberto Figueiredo, my colleague Jorge Shediek, the UN's resident coordinator in Brazil, uh, senior officials, ambassadors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues of the United Nations system. <clears throat> Let me begin by saying what a great pleasure it is to join our UN family and to be in this wonderful historic building of Itamaraty on this very special occasion in an annual calendar of events, many of which we celebrate, many of which we sometimes celebrate with perhaps a loss of historical appreciation of what gave rise to events and also memorial days when they first began. I thought it would be interesting to look back for a moment to the Charter, the Charter of the United Nations that was the foundation after the terrible events of the Second World War, in which the vision, the aspirations and the dreams of leaders from across the world articulated themselves in terms of what they believed the United Nations should be established for. A few points from the Charter. To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and the worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. Third, quote, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. Fourth bullet point, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. In short, The Charter was a very ambitious document at a very critical moment in human history. It is about people and our shared common humanity. It speaks to fundamental human rights and to fundamental concepts of justice. It underlines obligations arising from treaties and the imperative of social progress. We often talk today, and I have to admit, even I have not read the whole charter, and it was only in thinking about what would it be worthwhile to refer back to if we celebrate the United Nations Day, that I began to look at the charter with more interest. And I think, notwithstanding the fact that we are today debating in the United Nations system many aspects of reform, the fundamental intent of the charter of the United Nations remains as relevant today as it was then. But then the world lived in a very different setting, not just politically. We were just 2.3 billion people. Sometime next week we will celebrate and acknowledge the arrival of the seventh billion citizen on this planet. In just these few decades, we have more than tripled the presence of humanity on the planet. We have evolved from a world that was at that time still a colonial world in many ways a world that was dominated by a few world powers, passed through the periods of Cold War, saw liberation and post-colonial development emerge. And if you fast forward <clears throat> today, we live in a world in which, in fact, the center of economic gravity is shifting across the planet, where geopolitical formations that many of us have become accustomed to, and that many of you here in Itamaraty have also worked with over the decades, are shifting very significantly. Multilateralism is something that everybody invokes, that everybody believes should be a positive force for good. But we also have to acknowledge on a day in which we celebrate the idea of the United Nations, its history, its evolution, that there are many who today ask questions about the future of multilateralism. What is its role in a world in which The post-Cold War setting is not perhaps quite what some had anticipated in the late 90s. What is the role of the United Nations in a world that is in the midst of a financial and economic crisis that is affecting different parts of the world differently, but it is affecting everyone in some way, and yet 
the times when the new world economic order was being debated in the General Assembly and in the halls and corridors of the United Nations have long passed. The Center for Economic Governance is not necessarily centered in the traditional political arena of multilateralism. It is concentrated in some of the key economic institutions of the world. To some, that is progress. To others, it has raised questions. Certainly the financial crisis, the global stimulus packages, and now the questions that are being asked increasingly by citizens across the world of where is it that we are heading with our economic system, with our economic governance, with our institutions that can manage an ever more independent, interdependent international community gives rise to many questions. I raise these because to some, and this is something we have spent this morning discussing, the event of a real Plus 20 United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development is occurring at a time when the world is, in the view of some, supposedly preoccupied with other issues. And with Minister Patriota, we just spoke about this as well, and I think we are all convinced, in fact, that the opposite is true. It is precisely because of some of the crises we are living through right now that Brazil's hosting of Rio Plus 20 could not come at a better time. Now that is not necessarily the view out in the streets and the political corridors of the world as yet. And it is in this ambition to try and make a discourse and a conference and summit about sustainable development in the context of a multilateral negotiation and dialogue process relevant to the acute crisis of our time that the challenge for Rio plus 20 lies. Being preoccupied about a financial and economic crisis does not mean that you do not think about the future of your economies, about the future of development, and indeed about some of the key crises that are driving conflict around the debate in development today. The Arab Spring, the Occupy Wall Street or Occupy every other street that you designate as a symbol of your powerlessness as a citizen that we witness across the world at the moment, all of these are indicators of a public increasingly frustrated with the answers and the ability of our system to respond. We cannot afford another global stimulus package of three to four trillion dollars over the next two or three years. Our countries in parts of the world are so indebted already today that it would literally be a declaration of bankruptcy. What you witness at the moment in Europe is perhaps a European problem. But as our economy is so interdependent, it becomes everyone's problem. And yet those who are meant to sit at the table are not always there. What is the future of global economic, social and environmental governance in a world in which multilateralism is not having its greatest day in bringing problems to resolution? We are struggling in the world trade negotiations. We are struggling in the world climate negotiations. We are struggling even in sometimes addressing common fundamental agendas in the General Assembly. The patience of people towards the kinds of governance processes that we're able to deploy are being questioned. And I think it is precisely for that reason that that summit next year, those days in Rio de Janeiro when you as hosts Brazil, the Secretary General as the representative of the United Nations and heads of government, leaders of civil society, leaders of business, will come to a city to revive what was truly a remarkable spirit in 1992. There are many conferences in the multilateral world and the international system. There are few who can claim to have been historical. 1992 was historical. Will 2012 succeed in being a historical summit? The challenges are enormous. The discourse about sustainable development in some ways has matured with much more experience since Rio and many success stories. We have seen the sustainable development paradigm of Rio, the Rio principles, the Rio declaration, infuse in every country innovations, changes and transitions. But, and this is our great challenge as we look towards next year in Rio, what is our capacity not only to innovate and to experiment and to improve gradually, incrementally,
But has our capacity grown to address the fundamental problems that humanity faces at the beginning of the 21st century today? Inequity, poverty, greater food insecurity, greater climate insecurity, overuse of natural resources, economic and financial crisis, unemployment, youth disenchantment. It is not to draw a dark picture, but it is to acknowledge that the pace at which we have been able to adjust, evolve and transform our economies has not kept pace with the challenges that we are bound to answer if we do not want to end in these kinds of conflicts. The right to development, that fundamental building block that the United Nations and the member states of the United Nations agreed to in 1986 as being one of the fundamental rights to be addressed by multilateral international and collective action remains a key reference point. And I hope that in the discussions as we prepare for Rio next year that notion of the right to development evolved also with the knowledge of Rio since 1992 becomes a fundamental reference point because our ability to live together on this planet, and remember it just takes another 40 years and will be 9 billion people on this planet, is premised upon our ability to assure a degree of equity that allows the right to development to be realized by peoples wherever they live on this planet. The truth today is, ladies and gentlemen, that in many respects the fundamental indicators of sustainability and development are pointing in the opposite direction. We are disenfranchising current generations. We are expropriating future generations from their right to development. It is here that the challenge of our times lies and why I believe that our ability to come together next year in Rio is so fundamentally important in being able to provide answers. Answers that are rooted in the principle of fairness, equity amongst nation states. There are fora today that have emerged, be it the industrialized countries, be it the G20. They are vital parts of our capacity to address issues of the right to development, of international crisis management. But at the end of the day, nowhere else in the world is there one place where every nation however small, however economically insignificant to others, the right to be represented, to be heard, to be part of the negotiation, and to have a fundamental right to contribute to international governance is assured. It is the General Assembly of the United Nations with its subsidiary organs and bodies. I want to draw your attention to this because at the end of the day the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development is not just a conference or a summit in the city of Rio. Rio is hosting that idea of the General Assembly with all its rights and obligations through the vehicle of this conference. And to address issues that I think will ultimately determine whether the future years will be driven more by a design of evolution and transformation or by the dysfunctionality and the default of crises, revolutions, social discord, economic collapse, that are not so distant in terms of their reality. In fact, we see evidence of these phenomena all around us today. And there is almost a strange paralysis in addressing those. Thus, the themes that have been articulated for Rio, I believe, go to the heart of, first of all, setting this conference against the backdrop of an economic and financial crisis, but making it very clear that the answer to that is not just financial and economic instruments. It is to address the fundamentals of sustainable development and to make them the drivers for addressing a financial and economic crisis beyond the short-term measures. It is also to ask the question, is the institutional framework with which we are working today in multilateralism still appropriate to the geopolitical, social, economic, and environmental realities of the 21st century. If you accept the hypothesis that in many respects we are experiencing stagnation, then surely the conference in Rio next year must have the courage and the vision to articulate an agenda of how to make these institutions evolve in terms of contemporary issues, realities, and opportunities. And thus I, for one, believe that the UN General Assembly resolution and decision about what Rio should be about is actually an extremely appropriate one. 
but that needs to be filled with content and above all with a courage to politically lead these discussions into a new direction. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end by also reminding ourselves that sometimes in reviewing the United Nations effectiveness and relevance to today's issues, we often forget that in the larger geopolitical lens of looking at multilateralism, we forget, as also my colleague Jorge pointed out, that every day across this planet there are tens of thousands of people who are sometimes the last resort for survival. People with blue helmets, people with medical professions, people fighting and representing the human rights agenda, the gender equity agenda, the refugees of this world. Many of my colleagues do not have the luxury of being in the international conference rooms, the headquarters, the negotiating halls of our multilateral system. They are working on the front line of where societies are failing, where conflicts take over, where disease is simply not being addressed because there is not even the most basic infrastructure available. In periods of conflict, in periods of disaster, in periods of droughts, floods and earthquakes, it is often our colleagues in the United Nations who are part of your collective capacity to respond. Very often we are the last ones to leave when the situation becomes impossible to manage anymore in conflict. Often we are the very first ones to come back and try and help people to survive. Whether it is the World Food Programme, whether it is UNICEF, whether it is UNHCR, whether it is UNDP, whether it is the FAO, and I could name many others. They are part of what the United Nations is also about today. Perhaps not quite what was envisaged when that charter was signed, that we would very often become almost an ambulance service for a world that has so many places of failure. But it is also part of the mission that we in the United Nations celebrate today when we celebrate the United Nations Day. I hope that part of what Rio is also about is to reduce the crisis management nature of our work and to allow the notions of the right to development to become perhaps the centerpiece of a future value proposition to the United Nations. In that sense, could Rio represent a moment in times where ideas, directions and values linked to common humanity that have been maturing since the UN Charter was born could flourish and finally bear full, full fruit? Alors, a Presidenta Dilma Rousseff tem feito a história em muitas frentes, inclusive na ONU. Foi a primeira mulher a inaugurar a Assembleia Geral da ONU em 2011. E esperamos que, desde a primeira a inspirar e liderar o alcance de compromisso que esperamos obter na Rio Mais 20. Muito obrigado.